Hey everyone, welcome back to stage one. For those of you who are new, stage one is a space education program by students for students. And we talk about all sorts of cool space related subjects. So you can learn more about space exploration, the space industry and the future of space. So today we're gonna to be talking about the moon and the moon is a really important subject in uh, space exploration, of course. And we're gonna be going over the near future and long-term future of potential missions and settlements on the moon. But first let's start with the current event that many of you have probably heard about. I'll let Neil explain. Yes, yeah, so um, two days ago at the time of recording this, so October 26th, uh, NASA's um, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, also known as SOFIA, uh, confirmed that they had discovered uh, water on the sunlit surface of the moon. And SOFIA is a telescope facility aboard the Boeing 747, which is around 45,000 feet in the air. This is right over the Earth's uh, water, um, water vapor layer. And um, so, so yeah, this the water's presence um, water's presence on the moon has certainly been hypothesized before, but now we have definitive evidence. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about how they were actually able to confirm this. So molecules emit uh, wavelengths, and if you have um, the wavelength for a particular molecule, you are able to identify uh, what that molecule is. So um, the moon has a lot of hydroxyl which consists of one oxygen atom and one hydrogen atom, which is uh, similar to the composition of water, which is H2O. Um, so telescopes on Earth couldn't really differentiate between these two wavelengths, and that was due to the layer of water vapor. But since Sophia is above this layer, that wasn't really an issue, and it was able to distinguish between these two wavelengths. And um, one reason I think this news is really significant is because it, it teaches us that um, water is more accessible on the moon than we previously thought. 2018, um, it was confirmed that there was ice on the north and south poles of the moon, but now it's clear that, um, you know, the water isn't just limited to these, to these cold and dark areas, right? Because this was on the sunlit, uh, sunlit portion of the moon. So the catch with this is not much water was actually found. Uh, NASA said that the Sahara Desert has around 100 times more water than whatever was discovered on the moon. And we're also not really sure exactly how um, the water was able to survive these harsh lunar conditions. Scientists behind this study suggest that, um, that the water was stored within glass or between grains, both of which provide protection to the, to the water. But um, now that we now that we know that there is water on the moon, how did it how did it get there? So one way it could have gone there is through um, an asteroid, space dust, space dust from comets, or any other uh, celestial object that might have um, that, that strikes the moon. And another potential source could be solar wind. So solar wind is emitted by the sun and it contains hydrogen in its current. And um, if the solar wind uh, like contacts the moon the hydrogen could bond with oxygen to form hydroxyl or water. So um, yeah, so Anthony, do you wanna go back to that video a couple slides back? Sure, hopefully you guys can hear this. Let's see. So I, I can't hear the video, um, but yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, I'm unmuted. I don't think this video, this uh, this one needs uh, audio though, so we can play us out. Okay, so you just saw the the um, logo at the end for the Artemis program, uh, and the Artemis program is um, NASA's new Mar uh, moon mission that is supposed to bring uh, humans back to the moon 
the first time in 50 years um, within this decade. And Carl's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so, yeah, sure. So currently uh, there's two really important things happening right now with things necessary to getting Artemis space program sort of kicked off and getting us back on the moon. Uh, one of those is that NASA's space launch system, otherwise known as the LSS, L, the SL, the SLS, and the Orion spacecraft are nearing completion on their development. So the SLS is basically a super heavy lift launch vehicle, and the Orion is a reusable space capsule. Basically, the LSS is going to allow us to launch super heavy cargo like the Orion while also leaving low Earth orbit. And so the S SLS right now is currently our main uh, vehicle for deep space exploration. And so in preparation for the safest and earliest possible lunar landing, NASA plans to use those early Artemis missions for additional testing with Orion and as well as testing for human landing systems whenever possible. So one of the important parts of the Artemis Space program is setting up a gateway. And the gateway is basically just going to be an outpost or orbiting the moon. And to do that, NASA is planning to integrate the, so there's two important part, pieces of it. There's the habitat and logistics outpost, and then as a power system. And to get that up into space, NASA is basically planning to put that together um, on the surface of the Earth and then send that up on a spacecraft in the year 2023 on a single rocket. And then in 2024, the Orion will deliver its crew to lunar orbit. Uh, so the lander that will take the crew from... Uh, the Orion to the surface is going to be commercially developed, which I'll talk about more in a bit. Uh, but it'll be basically be capable of docking directly to the Orion for crew transfer in the earlier missions. Um, but NASA also wants to have the option of docking directly to the gateway. And then uh, once the crew gets to the surface, they'll wear the new Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit or XEMU spacesuit. And then from that point, they will explore the surface for about a week, I believe, before returning to the Orion for the trip home to Earth. Um, and so, and you can see on the screen, there's some of the sort of most promising lunar landers right now. And so lunar lander is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's just a spacecraft designed to land on the moon. Um, so right now there's the Apollo LEM, the Dynetics lander, uh, the national team from uh, Blue Origin and the one that you've all probably heard about before, the Starship. And one of the cool things about all of these is they're all reusable, uh, except for the Starship. But the one cool thing about that is it's big enough that it can be used as sort of part of like a beginning of an outpost or beginning of a lunar base. And so now I believe we're going to watch a video, uh, a little just a little bit more information directly from NASA about the Artemis space program and their plans for getting us back to the moon. Yep, hopefully the sound will work this time. Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions. Launch system comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. 
Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. All right, so now that you've gotten a sense of sort of the upcoming plans for moon missions, we're going to talk about stuff that might be happening a little bit further in the future, specifically moon colonization. Now, the first part of this conversation about uh, moon colonization and setting up moon bases is a discussion of what the challenges of living on the moon would be, what the challenges of setting up a moon base would be. So the first challenge, and maybe the most obvious one, is the moon is a vacuum, meaning that there is not an oxygen atmosphere or any other type of atmosphere at all. And uh, that means that inhabitants of any sort of moon base or astronauts on the moon would not be able to walk around on the surface of the moon without a spacesuit. And so if we're setting up a, a moon colony or moon base, that means any sort of uh, maybe bubble or structure that we build on the moon is going to need a constant supply of fresh and breathable oxygen so that our moon residents have a suitable habitat. So the second challenge is radiation. Now on Earth, we have a magnetic field and the ma our magnetic field is great because it deflects radiation and the sun emits a lot of radiation. Now, I'm sure you hear about the sun, the, the dangers of the sun's radiation every time you go to the beach with UV radiation being harmful to your skin, but the atmosphere actually deflects most of that radiation. So on the moon where there's no, sorry, the uh, magnetic field actually deflects a lot of that radiation. So on the moon when, where there's no magnetic field and uh, the, you know the moon is only partially protected from uh, radiation by Earth's magnetic field, that radiation problem is going to get a lot worse. So that means on the moon, you're going to need to have radiation shielding over everything. That means radiation shielding over spacesuits, radiation shielding over habitats, radiation shielding over sensitive equipment, additionally. So the third problem comes from the moon's rotation. So on the moon, a day is roughly equivalent to 29 days on Earth, so a month on Earth. Um, and the reason, obviously, that the days are so long on the moon is it takes the moon a really long time to rotate around its axis compared to the Earth. And what this means is that, uh, you know, areas of the moon can be exposed to the sun for a really long time. So um, the sunlit <coughs> moon during the lunar day is going to be really, really, really hot. So temperatures are gonna get up to 100 degrees Celsius. That's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the boiling temperature of water. So completely unlivable without, without you know, some, uh, some maintenance there. And that means um, we're gonna to have to do things to make sure that our um, moon base inhabitants can keep cool during the, the lunar day. Now, during the night, you have the reverse problem. It gets really, really cold. The, the temperatures get down to negative 100 degrees Celsius, right? So um, we have to make sure that there is temperature control all across the, the, the moon base. And this also affects solar power. So solar power might be a less viable power source on the moon because of these long days and long nights. 
Um, so now that we sort of have a sense of what it takes to live safely on the moon, the challenges and the solutions, let's talk about the benefits of a moon base. Why should we be setting up, you know, uh, established bases and colonies on the moon? What can we do there that's cool, that's different than what we can do on Earth? So the first thing is mining. Now, if you were at our last stage one session, we talked about asteroid mining, and we can also mine for minerals on the moon. Scientists think that there is a large supply of minerals on the moon. These minerals range from platinum to gold to titanium, and they tend to be close to the moon's surface or even on the moon's surface, where they can be easily extracted. In addition, Luckily for us, all of the required materials to mix concrete together are known to be present on the moon. And that's really useful to us because it means we can uh, mix together that concrete um, with you know, little complex equipment or processes needed and build durable, uh, reliable structures. And it means we don't have to transport structures all the way over from earth. Um, so that's a cool thing about setting up a moon base um you know you have those benefits from mining and the mining kind of allows you to be self self-sustaining in terms of uh, infrastructure development so astronomy now astronomy is what allowed us of course to discover the moon in the first place and we can do astronomy a lot better from the moon than we can from earth the reason is the aforementioned lack of an atmosphere and as some of you may know, on Earth, the atmosphere really, really clouds our ability to, to take pictures, um, you know, using telescopes, and it distorts those images, and it might block them out entirely on cloudy days, for example. On the moon, since there's no atmosphere, we can take clearer images of the night sky and, you know, maybe make new discoveries within the field of astronomy and set up more effective observatories. So, now I want to talk about water. So like Neil mentioned, water was recently discovered on the light side of the moon. Unfortunately, that water is too sparse to harvest. Remember, we're talking about quantities of around 1% of the amount of water that exists in the Sahara Desert, one of the driest deserts in the world. And um, the uh, polar ice caps on the moon on the other hand, have a lot more water in them. That means if we get to the poles of the moon, we can extract that water. Right now it's in the form of ice and we can use that water for a variety of things. Of course, we need water to drink. That's number one. Number two, we can use that water to you know, supply uh, water to, to plants and set up agriculture on the moon. Because remember, we also need food if we want to set up a permanent residence there. And um, thirdly, water can be split into hydrogen and oxygen, right? Those are the, the uh, atoms that compose the water molecule. And um, guess what? Hydrogen and oxygen make really great rocket fuel. So if we could harvest water, split it into hydrogen and oxygen, and use that to power rockets, that could make getting to Mars easier, that could make getting back to Earth easier, that could reduce the you know, bur burden of supplies, of supply transportation, we wouldn't necessarily have to transport as much rocket fuel from, from Earth to the moon, so that's a, a really good thing. Now, in a broader sense, going to the moon has benefits because it gives our species another place to live. And this is an is important thing in case we need more room, more resources. And it's also an important thing to make sure uh, we do because we don't wanna have all of our eggs in one basket. The earth is just in the grand scheme of things, a tiny speck of dust floating through um, the cosmos. And even though the moon is just another speck of dust, you never know what could happen to one of those specks of dust. So, uh, it's better for, for humanity to shut, set up shop on the moon as well. So now that you have a general sense of you know, the challenges and benefits of setting up a moon base, I will let Anthony get into a cool specific proposal for said moon base. Yeah, so we talked about Artemis. Um, we talked about the challenges. Um, but the, Artemis is a, um, is a near-term uh, moon mission, right? it's not actually trying to set up a permanent moon base, uh, the kind of thing that we really want. Um, it's just going to uh, explore and research, which is really great, um, but it's not planning to um, set up a, a permanent outpost there. Uh, it's not actually making a home for anyone, right? This is a little bit different. We're gonna do a case study of a really ambitious plan uh, for a long-term moon base 
but a long-term moon base that we could perhaps construct in the next 15 years. I, I've heard some estimates that this could be done in 2035, 2040, right? And what's, what sets this apart um, is that it's actually very simple and easy to set up. So the core of it is an inflatable sphere. Right here, you see a cross section. This little diagram shows you a cross section of the sphere. Um, and basically the only thing that the astronauts have to carry with them or the lander has to carry with it is a membrane, a kind of uh, pneumatic envelope, just like the latex on the outside of a balloon that holds in the air when you blow it up um, and forms the shape of the balloon. Uh, this is the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing um, that when the lander comes down, it unfolds this membrane, right, very simply, and fills it up with oxygen. It's an inflatable sphere, right? It fills it up with the air, just like on Earth, right? Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to find a spot that has either a crater or an artificially dug trench in the moon. As you see, here's the surface. You can see the surface on the diagram and the bottom half of the sphere kind of lying inside of it. That provides, um, that secures the, 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 um, the structure inside the moon and it also provides some protection, right? Uh, so that's not all that, that we have to do for this space though. Uh, just this membrane doesn't provide enough protection from all these threats uh, that uh, George talked about, especially radiation and even meteorites. There are a lot of meteorites that strike the moon. And if you have a flimsy base, the flimsy uh, exterior to your base, it's going to be very dangerous, right? So what we do is that after we inflate it, we actually pile, um, pile material on the outside. So most likely, uh, that would take the form of the lunar dust. It's kind of like dirt, actually. Um, it's called the regolith. Uh, so we would pile a very thick layer of that dust packed tightly on the top of this inflatable sphere, right? It would be about five feet thick. So that's pretty thick because you need that kind of thickness to protect the astronauts inside, right? Um, other than that, though, like I said, this design is very elegant, very simple. You also have on the right side, you can see the lunar airlock. That is actually really cool because it serves a dual function. That's actually the capsule that comes down with and houses the, um, the astronauts. That's the lander. Um, it also serves as the airlock once it's inflated, right? So your astronauts can go in, um, keep make sure that the, the, that the sphere stays pressurized, but be able to leave the, the structure in their spacesuits, do whatever they need to do um, on the outside of, uh, on, the, on the lunar surface, come back and be safe, right? Um, you see that we have everything that you need inside the sphere for a colony or an outpost, right? You have um, crew quarters, so you live in there, you have operations, communications, all that kind of stuff to be able to do everything that you need all in one place in a very secure home base a headquarters, right? So, um, this design was first proposed in, I think, the late 80s, early 90s. But since then, it's gotten a lot of traction. A lot of people love this idea. Um, but there's been edits. There's been variations that people have done on this, you know, add-ons um, that, that people have thought of. So I'm going to go over a couple of those. Uh, one of them uh, is that many people think that this base could best be utilized um, if we construct it inside an underground cave or lava tube on, on the moon. So when you look up at the moon, it looks pretty smooth. There's no mountains or, or you know, ridges or anything like that uh, to the naked eye, but there's actually a lot of tunnels and caves beneath the surface, right? So if we could get into one of these caves and put up shop there, uh, we'd, be, we'd have more protection. We'd have you know, a thermal barrier uh, from, from those wild temperature changes that George mentioned. Uh, overall, it would just be a safer, um, a safer place for a long-term base, right? Uh, and the other variation, which is actually really cool, is the European Space Agency's proposal, right? The European Space Agency um, recently drew up a plan called Mars Camp, and I would encourage everybody to uh, go ahead and, and look up the details of that because there's a lot of stuff involved. But the main two things... Uh, I'm going to show you that real quick. 
well, this is just, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't show you this. This is a, this is a drawing of the, inflatable, of the inflatable sphere. It was commissioned by NASA. It looks like a picture. It's really cool. It's like as if you're right on, on, on the moon. Um, this is kind of what it would look like. Um, it might look more like a, uh, like a big hill because you're kind of all packed, all, all this material packed on. It wouldn't even look like it, like it, was, a, it was a base. And I'll show you this. This is Mars camp. This is the European Space Agency's proposal. And you can see how it's kind of like a hut. It's really dug into the ground for safety. And they added two things. One of them you can see really easily, um, which are the, the skylights on the top. Those skylights um, provide light. I mean, it's really important uh, for, for humans to have natural light. Um, it's, it's important for mood, uh, for productivity. Uh, so they added four, four skylights on the top uh, just, just for, for quality of life. And the second one, which is more important, are um, autonomous robots, right? So if you see on the side of these of these two uh, of these two um, spheres that are uh, most to the right, you can actually see two of these robots going at it, right? So what could happen is one of these capsules could land even without an astronaut or any astronauts or colonists at first. It could land completely autonomously, and these robots could go out, pick up the lunar dust, the dirt, heat it up to make it stronger, to pack it tighter, and then actually 3D print it with a little robotic arm onto the top, onto the top of, of the sphere. Just like if you've ever seen a 3D printer, just like a regular printer, but it can go um, up, you can make any type of shape. You could print these lines on the top of these spheres, that way that your astronauts don't have to do that, don't have to spend so much time outside on uh, the lunar surface, on the harsh lunar surface. Um, and they could, it could do it for them. So that's basically, um, the, the, you know, the, the entirety of this proposal, but there's also other ones, which are even more far, even farther in the future. And I'm going to mention this. I'm not going to go fully into it because there's a lot of details, but there's also such thing as a moon dome city, right? Uh, so a lot of, there's a lot of talk about terraforming planets. And if you were at our last session, we did discuss briefly uh, terraforming Mars and some possible strategies. It's a very large topic. Uh, there's a lot to say about it. But long story short, terraforming is very hard. Terraforming, you're trying to get, you're trying to build an atmosphere, right, on this huge planet, right? It's, it's very difficult to get, to get that much air onto the planet to create a breathable atmosphere. This is kind of um, this is kind of a, a solution to that to that issue, which is you could create a large dome, probably made out of glass or some other material, um, a large dome to cover an outside, basically an outside area on the moon, and then just add air to that portion, and and, and the dome would keep the air in, right? This way, you could actually instead of just building these, you know, um, these these huts you'd be able to build a whole city. So you could, you could think that this could be the first, you know, the first way we, we start to have a civilization on the moon, right? A whole, um, a whole you know, country maybe on the moon. Um, there's actually a detailed proposal um, that, that was made by, by a NASA engineer. It's, the dome would be 25 miles in diameter. So that would be able to house a lot of people. Like it would be five miles high in the middle. It would be made out of, um, two foot thick glass, very strong glass, almost as strong as steel. Um, and uh, one of the other cool things which I wanna mention is that uh, even for this uh, dome city, you would still need a lot of gas, but the gas is not just oxygen for breathing. You need, um, you also need nitrogen. On earth, our air is 71% uh, nitrogen, I think, and 29% oxygen. So, you need that nitrogen because we're accustomed to having nitrogen in our air, uh, even though we don't, uh, even though we just need the oxygen, and for, you need it for safety reasons because oxygen is highly combustible. So this proposal includes a plan to actually use the polar ice caps on the moon for that nitrogen. We talked about how there's water in those ice caps, but it turns out that there's also ammonia, and you can extract ammonia and make nitrogen out of it. So that's just a, a, a cool little part of that proposal for, for this dome city um, that you could check out yourself. So now onto our discussion questions. George, do you wanna um, go over these? 
So, yeah, um, the first one is kind of a more general one. Um, it's, uh, would you want to go to the moon in the next decade and be an early explorer to learn new outposts? So this kind of depends, like, what you think life on the moon would be like and, you know, what, um, what sort of risk tolerance you have. So, like, this is a completely unexplored area for the most part. And, like, um, there are pros and cons of that. And, you know, would you want to be one of the first lunar colonists? So the second question is a bit of a funny question. We got it from one of our younger students um, at one of our library sessions. And we just uh, thought there was a lot, kind of a lot of depth to this question and its implications, even though it's, it's um, it sounds funny, like, would there be a president to the moon? But really what, what um, we want you to think about is what would a political system on, on a, in a moon colony look like? You know, would this moon colony try to be independent from Earth? Would it be democratic or non-democratic? Um, you know, would there be land ownership? And these are questions that don't have clear answers because uh, we've never set up shop on the moon. We've never lived on the moon in, moon in a permanent human settlement. And what sort of answers we we provide to those questions as a civilization could determine, you know, the the future of, of human life in space and what precedent we set for hopefully the billions and billions of people that come after us that live uh, on the moon, on Mars, and, you know, on, on other planets and maybe even in other solar systems. So, yeah, just some stuff to uh, take away. And um, we, we could answer the first one, just, just give our answers. Um, to me spark some some thinking. Uh, do you want to do that, guys? Sure. Sure. So, um, m you know, I guess my answer would be, I think, I think I would m maybe want to visit the moon later on for a little while, maybe live there temporarily. I don't know if I would want to be one of the very first, uh, you know, uh, colonists on the moon because i don't know how much value i could provide in that role um but uh you know eventually i i do want to go to the moon at some point even if it's just kind of a vacation and i hope everybody has the opportunity to to do something like that in our lifetimes yeah yeah i agree with that i think that in the next decade or even in the next 15 years it'll probably be still very dangerous to go to the moon um, and to stay there for for a um, for a long period of time because of all the, all the issues that we brought up. But there's even more. You know, you, you could you could start listing them. Like, uh, for example, the low gravity, right? That can cause um, issues with bone density and you know the strength of your body, right? There's so much stuff, and we're probably not even thinking of, of some of some of this stuff because we just haven't done it yet, right? You need to go and experiment before you you really fully understand it. So I would I would say that I do want to be able to uh, go to the moon eventually, maybe in 20, 25 years, something like that. Uh, but for now, I think I'll hold off until we learn more. Um, so yeah, Anthony mentioned like a lot of dangers of, of going to the moon. I think that's probably my biggest concern. I feel like, it, you know, this, as George said, it's a completely unexplored area. Nobody's ever been here. We don't know really much about it. and you know, a lot of the long-term implications of living in such an environment. And I think, you know, while it could be really cool and exciting, and while I do want to go to the moon as soon as possible, I, like George, I also don't know how much I could contribute being uh, one of the first explorers. And I'm not sure if that would be like the best job or the best role for me. Um, but yeah, I definitely do want to go to the moon as soon as, we, as soon as we figure out that it's safe to do so. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I definitely agree with what everyone said. The exploring the moon is incredibly important uh, just for the prospects of a moon base and even a Mars base. Um, I'm not sure if it's something that's personally for me, but um, yeah, I mean, I'd certainly love to visit the moon at some point. So I think quickly that kind of hopefully gives you a sense of like, you know, uh, how, how important this role is of, you know, the person, the type of person who's gonna be going in this to the moon in this collaborative effort to set up the first colonies, the first bases, and you know, how, how specialized you have to be to that sort of role. And you know, I hope one of you watching is potentially interested in that, because even though there are dangers and risks, there are also huge upsides. I mean, you are, you are doing something that 
nobody else has ever gotten to do or will ever get to do set up the first you know permanent settlements on an entirely different you know celestial body and you're also maybe uh going to get the chance to have a huge impact by making sure that things are are set up there correctly you know we talked about some of the potential different political and and economic conditions that it could exist here and right you're you're sort of planting the the seed for you know hopefully a large human civilization to to come after you so you know and also worth considering there are so many other jobs that go into you know setting up the first moon colony right the engineers the politicians um the um you know the programmers everything so there there are a lot of uh ways to help and this mission will only be as we said it's a very challenging mission and this mission will only be accomplished if we all put our minds to it okay i feel like um that's a pretty good place to end um do you guys have anything to add oh yeah just uh uh for those of you who don't know we're running stage one through the mentor project so if you want to learn more about stage one go to the web mentor projects website and you'll also be able to see a lot of other cool stuff and thank you and stay tuned for next week's session